Let us seek him now. Father God, we come before you for we praise you and thank you. We look to you for our help. Where does our help come from? It comes from you, O Lord. It comes from you. So we cry out to you and ask for your help. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your strength. We ask for your mercy. Lord, thank you that you have saved us. Thank you that you have healed us. Lord, I just pray for your move of your spirit, that you would breathe fresh wind upon us, Lord. You breathe within us the power of your spirit, that we would be strengthened by your word and empowered to live and serve you faithfully. Guide us in your word as we hear from you today, that it be your word that is heard and that it would touch our hearts, convict us of our sins, rebuke us, inspire us, challenge us, and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the story is told of the foreman of a building site who asks one of the builders what he was doing. And the builder replies, I'm breaking rocks. And other workers ask the same question, and he answers, I'm earning for my family. The question is posed to a third worker, and with a glint in his eye, he responds, I am building a cathedral. Kenneth Mitchell was a pa- is pastor of the Westside Christian Fellowship Chapel in Jacksonville, Florida, relayed this story. He says, years ago, he worked part-time on the loading docks of various trucking companies. Uh, and uh, one company met a fellow part-timer, a fine Christian young man uh, named Rufus Kidd. He had just completed his associate's degree in transportation and was seeking a full-time career. And since the company uh, was beginning to open up to minorities at that time, Rufus, an African-American, went in to interview for the position. Later, Kenneth asked him how the interview went, and he said they offered him a job in sales, something that would pay well and offer unlimited opportunities for him. Kenneth was excited for him, but he said, but Rufus said, I'm not going to take it. Although it was everything he wanted, in order to take it, he would have to give up his ministry with singles at his church. And he said he would wait for a job to come along that would allow him to continue to teach his class. He, too, was building a cathedral. In Matthew 7, Jesus made this bold and powerful statement. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains, rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, he will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, that floods, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. What kind of life we build must begin with the right foundation. And any foundation that does not rest on Christ is is faulty and weak and will fall apart. It will not withstand the wind and waves of sin, evil, human philosophies, and the devil himself. It will crumble and fall, for it is built on the wrong foundation. The life we build, the life we seek, is the Christ life. The cathedral built is God's kingdom. Christ talked about this kingdom. It's the final kingdom, the greatest kingdom. It will not falter. It will not fail. It's eternal, and it cannot be defeated or overthrown. No army can overcome God's kingdom. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It is an enduring and true kingdom. All human kingdoms and rule will end and be forgotten. In Daniel, we read this in Daniel 2, as, as he was, Daniel was talking to King Nebuchadnezzar. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to the other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, all these human kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. I just picture the kingdoms of the world that we have built with our human strength, our human intellect, our human wisdom will fall apart will become dust and blown away, never to rise again, because God alone is God. 
God's kingdom is forever. It is true and real. In the book of Hebrews, we read this, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. God will shake the heavens and the earth, and those things that are shaken are gone, removed, forgotten. For that which is not built on the word of God is removed, will fall apart. But we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken because it is, it is on the solid rock of Christ. Christ is our solid rock. When we come to God in repentance, we seek his forgiveness. We desire his love. We want what he wants for us. We come to him dead in our sins, but God through Christ has made us alive. For Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. When we come to Christ and receive Christ and declare him Lord, we enter into the kingdom. We are told in Colossians 1, this beautiful promise. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, transported us, transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He's taken us out of darkness and sin and brought us into Christ. We are given a new citizenship. We are brought into the kingdom of God. We're removed from the kingdoms of this world. Those that will fall and placed into the hand, we will be placed in the hands of God. We're no longer citizens of this world, those that we are now citizens of a new kingdom. We are sojourners, aliens, and strangers to this world. We belong to God. We belong to his kingdom. We say, this is not my home, but God is my home. This is why we become a person who seeks one thing, God's presence. We desire your presence, O oh Lord. We know that even though we live in the world, we are not of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. We're not of the world. We have a different calling, a different culture, a different lifestyle. We have a different identity. We have a different citizenship. <coughs> we are no longer citizens of America, Russia, uh, Italy, France, China, or wherever you're from. We are citizens of heaven. Let's make sure we act like it. And reveal it. But in addition, we invite all we can to say, hey, come join. Come be part of this kingdom that God has built for you. That God is inviting you in. We want you here. We desire you to know the God who loves you so deeply. Because this kingdom will endure. This kingdom is true freedom. This kingdom is true life. This kingdom is true light. <clears throat> The kingdom of God is the best for us because God is the best for us. When you come into the kingdom of God, you submit and surrender to his reign and rule. You, we say, you are God. You reign, O Lord. Build your life in the kingdom of God, revealing all who Christ truly is. I want you to know today, God reigns. God reigns, and that is an absolute truth that cannot be denied. You can deny it in your mind. You can say it's not true, but it is true. He does reign. Live and trust those words, God reigns. The Bible says in Colossians, set your mind on things above, not on the things of earth. Why? Because if you keep your eyes on the things of earth, you will not see what God is doing. You will get lost in, the huma in humanity and falter and become discouraged, fall into despair. But when you think of the things of God, what he is doing, how he is moving, how he is working, you will rejoice and say, God, you are awesome. Our God reigns. Our God gives. Our God loves. Our God offers. When we think of the word dictator, we think of the one ruling with a clenched iron fist. When we hear God reigning, we think of God's open hand and extended arm saying, come unto me and I will give you rest. I will give you hope. I will save you and bless you. I will forgive you of all of your sins. Let me give you an example of a dictator from the 20th century, a guy named Nicola, Nicolae Sesescu, who was the communist president of Romania in the 70s and 80s, who brutally plundered Romania and reshaped it in his own sick image. 
Although Romania's soil was the most fertile in Eastern Europe, Sosescu's government managed to starve its people. This is a picture of him. Citizens shivered in long lines to buy bread laced with sawdust while the government shipped most of its uh, food abroad. All food items were rationed. But how did Sosescu and his officials eat? For his wife's birthday, he had three kinds of caviar, pâté de foie gras. Did I say that right? Okay. Filet mignon, roast beef, baby pork, pork chops, pork loin, venison, roast turkey, Gornish game hens, pheasants, lobster, frog legs, smoked salmon, and three kinds of trout. While his people competed for bony chickens and the occasional pork knuckles, he ate lavishly. Sosescu promoted his pet program of systemization, which raised thousands of rural villages and transferred their citizens to apartment blocks and designated urban industrial centers. These concrete dwellings were composed of dark, tiny rooms and flimsy walls smelling of sewage and open garbage. Heated by a central system controlled by some sadistic state functionary, the block apartments were maintained about 50 degrees during the winter, and many families had hot water only once a week, and electricity was rationed as well. 40-watt balls were the highest wattage that you could have, and, and they had current only certain hours of the day. Sosescu demanded every family have five children since the fetus is the property of the state. And because of this, birth rates increased, but so did infant mortality. Unable to feed their babies, many parents were forced to abandon them. Eventually, more than 200 state-run orphanages dotted Romania, miserable monuments of Sosescu's most helpless citizens. This all happened while the secret police recruited citizens to become informants on one another. It was a tumultuous and unsafe environment. This is what a dictator does. This is the pattern and modern uh, model a dictator follows. The more power a dictator has, the more death he creates, the more hate, tyranny, and oppression and hurt. The dictator promotes self. The dictator exalts self. It's all about power. Tyranny of self is never an avenue for freedom. But when God reigns, you see freedom, you see help, you see salvation, you see forgiveness, you see God's great love. God brings life and hope. He is the expression of freedom. He's the king. His kingdom is one where he reigns and he rules. His kingdom operates under a different rule and different law. It follows a different pattern. It follows God's will and God's way. It's his kingdom and he reigns. When the heart and the human heart reigns, Death reigns. When God reigns, life is given. You know, as we study Romans, we see the kingdom of God emerge as Paul described the life we're called to live. We are called to present our bodies as living sacrifices. And when we do, God receives that sacrifice and calls it holy. As we present our bodies as living sacrifices, we no longer conform to the world, but rather transform by the renewing of our minds, causing us to know God's will and heart. The transformed heart and renewed mind compels us to live the life of Christ that he has called us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Love becomes the drive, the gospel message, serving the, serving the heart and, and uh, worship becomes our motivation. We seek to obey God, bring about his word and his will to the lost and dying world. We say this lost and dying world, we become burdened for the lost and the hurting. We want to build up the church and not tear down the and we do want to tear down the strongholds of the enemy. We do this because God reigns. We know it deeply, we know it truly, and we exalt the Lord for he is good. So number one, God's reign is revealed in his love. Let's take a look at Romans 14, uh, starting with verse 13. Uh, it says, therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. No, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food for the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit. When you act contrary to God's word, you're intentionally doubting his word and doubting his reign. When you act in accordance with God's word, you're fulfilling his will and making him known. 
when we are approach each other, we are to approach each other in Christ, with Christ, and because of Christ. Christ is the best for us. He is the best for you. In this chapter, Paul is talking specifically about the church community and the attitudes we're to have in that community. People will come with different convictions. People will have different views of how righteousness is to be expressed. Some will say you have to eat certain foods and stay away from certain foods, while others may say you, can, you, you have to honor one day above another. And the key thing is not to fall into a law-based reality where certain laws have to be obeyed or your white righteousness is questioned. Now, I'm not talking about doctrines that are absolute, you know. We cannot say, well, murder is okay for me and it's not for you. No, that's not what we're talking about here, okay. Uh, it's, it's not okay. There are things that are wrong, and they're wrong all the time. There are no convictions about that. Same is true with adultery, lying, things like that. <coughs> Got a thing in my throat. Paul is not talking about the doctrine of absolutes, but convictions of certain habits and traditions. Instead of seeking to win a fight, seek to win a friend and develop a stronger community. Appreciate the convictions of others. Do not see them as obstacles, but ways to bless them. You know, mercy triumphs over judgment. The Living Sacrifice Church is one that does not bring condemnation, but mercy. Do not approach others in judgment, but mercy, grace, and God's goodness. Approach others to learn and to appreciate that other person. Approach others in Christ. The Living Sacrifice Church does not seek to judge those in the church about the traditions certain people do have. Instead, we're to make the traditions of others, or we're not to make those traditions of others to the focus of the church because Christ is always our focus. He must always be our focus. So first thing, love is to be your priority. There, the law of love, that is God's reign, calls us to hold to our convictions of certain traditions and to not become offensive in how we use those convictions. We can use certain convictions as a weapon to truly offend others and throw it in people's faces. Paul, look look at verse 14, says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. Paul did not see any food as unclean. He had no problem with others, and he didn't, and he probably may or may not have eaten unclean food. It was not, that was not his priority. However, even though he did not see any food as unclean, that did not mean he can just freely eat, offending those around him. Rather, he wants to see unity among the people and to have a hospitable character and say, how can I best love you? You know, instead of seeking what are are my rights, we approach each other with the attitude of how can I bless and serve you today? How can I build you up? Paul told the church to not judge one another, for that in and of itself becomes a stumbling block. Judgment in the context that Paul is talking about originates from the heart of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is insidious, and it will take a life of its own. It will divide. It will invite gossip. It will create animosity. Eventually, you will crucify each other. We will crucify each other with self-righteousness because self-righteousness is not humble and a contrite lifestyle, but rather a proud and unwilling lifestyle. There is no grace given in self-righteous attitude. Instead, we are to counter the temptation of self-righteousness by continuing to rely fully on the righteousness of Christ, for he reigns and we do not. Paul gave an example of the lifestyle love and priority of love. Imagine, he says, uh, uh, it, this is kind of my imagination of how I see him doing it. You know, imagine some guy eating a ham sandwich when a brother who's convinced this is wrong <coughs> becomes offended, and the temptation when you stand up for your rights say, well, I am free in Christ. You just watch me eat this sandwich. <coughs> Take that. I have every right to eat this food. Paul says you're no longer walking in love. Instead, you're hurting your brother, not building up. Your freedom, your good, is now seen as wrong and evil, and division begins to take root. A hard heart will begin to develop. There are some who will take offense at everything and will never be satisfied. That's why Paul wrote earlier, if at all possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And some people just will never be satisfied. They'll, they'll find wrong and no matter what. So you continue to live in your freedom. 
You may not be able to peace with everyone, but continue to do the things that God is calling you to do. Continue to walk in love. Continue to show the grace of God. Continue to show his mercy. When love is your priority, then you will not seek to use your rights as a weapon, but rather you will seek to serve one another. You will, not, you will turn the other cheek. You will lift up and not cast away. You will care and not be indifferent. You know, in Second Chronicles 29, it's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> Hezekiah was telling the, the, the Levites, says, you need to sanctify the congregation, you know, the, the temple. You need to go out and get rid of the rubbish. Well, we're the temple of God. And we need to say, Lord, is there rubbish in my life? I need to clean that out. And we need to ask God, Lord, is there rubbish that needs to be gone? Because it's easy to pretend it's not there or even look past and say, oh, I never knew. (laughs) Oh, it's there. The kingdom of God is built on God's love. God's love is God's power. His power is seen in his love. The gospel is the power of God. What is that power? Restoration, forgiveness, salvation, hope, adoption. It's the transformed life. When you lose sight of what God's kingdom is, you begin to follow a different law instead of the law of love. The kingdom is revealed in God's righteousness. It's revealed in God's peace and joy and the power of the Holy Spirit. If you restrict the kingdom to food and drink, then that is all it is. It's limited to what it can do. It's powerless in bringing change. It has no message of grace. There will be no transformation but simply conformity. There will be no freedom, no hospitality, no love expressed. And when the kingdom of God is revealed, God's reign is revealed. And we'll be keeping an eye on each other. What are you eating? And we'll be looking over everyone's shoulder. And is that freedom? No, we're back to that dictator. In Romania. When the God's kingdom is revealed, God's reign is revealed, God's heart is made known, God's love is expressed, people seek to carry out the image of Christ and forsake the image of self. Others will seek to bless others with words of grace. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. <coughs> When the message is reduced to eating and drinking, then what you create is an opportunity for a dictator to rise in all the tyranny that it will bring. But when you love when love is a priority, God's reign is revealed and the freedom it brings and the joy. Exalt the Lord God because He reigns. Number two, God's reign compels to edify. Let's look at verses 18 through 20. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by man. Therefore, let us pursue the thing which make it for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. You know, when I read verse, seven, uh, verse 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I realize we, have such a lo- we can have such a low view of righteousness. We have a limited view, a view that makes righteousness a trying word, a debilitating expectation, a tiring prospect. Righteousness, as it is understood in Scripture, is the fullness of God's character, is so much more than we can even imagine, so much more in the freedom that it offers. The word edify here is we are called to edify each other. In verse 19, it's a word that's used by Peter when he mends the nets. Edifies mending. It's a healing word. It's a putting back to what was broken or torn. It's a repairing what is damaged word. It's edify is a word that means to serve, to help, to bless. The Bible says in Ephesians, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Edification happens in how we speak. We're to speak words that impart grace. We're to speak with words that build up and not tear down. We're to speak to others in and with Christ and because of Christ. The Bible says in Colossians, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So speak in a way of Christ with the words of Christ is to serve and it demonstrates the reign of God. So first thing, Keep Christ as your focus. You know, Christ is calling us to serve him. We are to serve Christ as we speak to one another and we edify one another. We're called to change. You're called to change your attitude from what about me to what about Christ. 
Christ came not to be served, but to serve. Christ offered himself. Christ is the perfect sacrifice. Christ is holiness. Christ is our peace. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is all that we need and greater than we have ever could ever understand uh, in, 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 our, in our need. We belong to a different reign. We're not citizens of earth, but of the eternal kingdom. We have an attitude of serving and not taking, of serving and not ruling. We want to build up and not tear down. The church is called to serve Christ, and when we do it, it is acceptable to God and approved by us. You know, the servant attitude really comes out in these verses. We're not to wage a war against one another based on convictions of food and drink and a special day. We're not to seek righteousness apart from Christ, for Christ is our righteousness. We're not to try to make ourselves distinct by what we eat or drink, but rather we are to be distinct by how we love and God's love through us and Christ serving through us. This calls for the church to pursue peace and edification. The church that knows righteousness brings peace. I am not fighting for my righteousness or even having to prove it, but rather to demonstrate it through the love of God. It is his love that has proven God's righteousness. It is his grace, his mercy, and his act of serving. When God served in Christ, he revealed his reign. For God does reign. And we say, Lord, reign in my heart. Reign in my life. Show your righteousness in me. Because that's all that matters is yours. Finally, God's reign is expressed and realized in faith. Let's take a look at verse 21. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he proves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. It is evil for the man who eats with offense. Basically, I get the image of a person eating something, person eating something and someone is offended, and then he eats it all the more. As I mentioned earlier, this is my food. Take that, as he may shove another mouthful in. I can eat whatever I want. I'm free. Yes, you are. But why use your freedom to provoke one another, to, ma- to demand from others, to fall into a yoke of bondage all over again? You know, if you make food of your right and your rights to this food your priority, now you have to eat that food just to prove your point. But when you are free, you can eat it or not. Food is not the priority, but Christ is. Even Christ said in Matthew 15, now... Not that what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. It's the heart that's evil. (laughs) It is what is in the heart of man that shows that we're not righteous. Do you think of any kind of action on your part can remove the sin that is in your heart? Can we in any way remove even a gram of sin from our heart when it took Christ to die on the cross for us? Could we even match that? Couldn't even come close to that. The only solution is faith, faith in Christ, faith in God, faith in the finished work of Christ, faith in his word, faith knowing it is finished, as he declared. Righteousness cannot be produced by me, only the defilement of my wicked heart. But faith in Christ brings his righteousness into my life. Because of what Christ's righteousness calls me to serve you and you to serve me, it calls us to ask the question, how can I bless you today? How can I love you today? The key point Paul is making is that you do not doubt. You're not to doubt where your righteousness comes from. Never doubt that. Number one, know the certainty of Christ's accomplishments. Know the certainty. It is true our righteousness is secure in Christ. He did die. He did rise. We are certain, and certainty does not dwell in doubt, right? Our lifestyle is one who helps us to strengthen our faith and not increase doubt. We do, not want, we do want to help others to see Christ. We want them to find him and seek their help in him, to find their strength in him, because faith in Christ is secure. When we cause others to second-guess themselves, we bring doubt into their mind. In 1421, we see that we can cause others to stumble who have different convictions and yet proudly display freedom and rights. You can bring someone to doubt. Now, we're not the source of another's faith. I get that. People can be offended and stumble over many things, though, through no fault of your own. That doesn't mean you go and pursue that doesn't mean you kind of live toward that you live to bring love in the situation God's love 
God's love is the calling. God's heart is the key. We're called to be united in Christ. We can help each other out in our unity by having that hospitable spirit and servant mentality. Paul wanted each person the living, to live the living sacrifice life, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in lowliness of mind to let each esteem others better than himself. As we approach one another, we can approach each other with a humble heart, seeking to learn from them, wanting to bless them and encourage. When Paul was talking about prophecy and the prophetic to the Corinthians, he said this, but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. You know, as I read this chapter, I think of Barnabas. Barnabas is uh, translated son of encouragement. What a great name, huh? Would you like to be called Barnabas? In Acts 11, something amazing happened. For the first time, a church was planted in the city of Antioch where Jew and Gentile were both invited in. It was an amazing thing. And the people in Jerusalem, the, the, the Jerusalem church was going, well, can, is this right? Can we have Gentiles in the church? Is there like something they should do first to get saved? And they were struggling with this idea. And they thought, we need to send somebody down to Antioch to make sure that this is okay. Who should we send? And they chose Barnabas. He would give the right report. And so Barnabas went down to the city of Antioch, and he met the men and women of this fledgling church. And what did Barnabas see? Well, I can tell you what he didn't see. He didn't see Jew. He didn't see Gentile. He saw Christians. He saw people who knew Jesus. He saw Christ in their lives and grace given. In Acts 11, we read this. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that, that, that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. He saw Christ in them, the hope of glory. He approached people with grace, not to debate them, but to encourage them. He approached them with and in Christ, wanting to strengthen their faith, not discourage it. He approached them with humility, wanting to teach them and build them up and not tear them down. I wonder if someone else had gone, if he would have seen the same thing. What are you seeing? How are you approaching others? Since God reigns, walk in victory and freedom. Since God reigns, let's approach each other with Christ, in Christ, and because of Christ. Let us pray. Our dear Father, I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. And I pray this over our church, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory with which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be one just as we are one. In them and in you, in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I pray that over us, Lord. I pray that you fulfill that in us. I pray we will not fight it. I pray we won't challenge it, but we will simply obey it. 